Canal Barge Company is proud to sponsor the Bureau of Governmental Research as they honor excellence in government. For almost 90 years, the Bureau of Governmental Research has worked in the metropolitan New Orleans area to improve the effectiveness of local government. The organization known as BGR is a nonprofit independent research organization that publishes in depth reports on complex public policy issues. So, BGR is a private, nonprofit, independent research organization. Um, that's key because we're not funded by government. We are funded exclusively by citizens. Locally, it's a mix of corporations and individuals and foundations who support our work. The quality of life here in our community is critical. You, you wouldn't have your business here successfully if there's not a, a good quality of life. And a big part of the quality of life is that you have fair and competent government. And so as a corporate citizen, we like to support BGR because it's truly the gold standard for research. Uh, it provides information that informs government, informs the citizens, and really enables better government here. I feel like BGR is the advocate's advocate. BGR fulfills an incredible mission in our community, not only because they are so well staffed and possess such an incredible amount of expertise in their research and their work is so thorough. I think it's most important for our viewers to recognize that government cannot, whether it's local, state, or federal government, they cannot work in isolation. Our work is for the purpose of um, creating an informed citizenry on public policy issues. So we identify existing and emerging issues, problems that, that we think uh, need to be matched with best practice solutions. So we do really in-depth research. Our team consists of journalists and PhDs and lawyers, so we dig in very deeply to understand where and how it's done better. They go to multiple sources and they do deep, deep, deep work in verifying everything they possibly can before they publish. So it's, it's very fastidious and uh, professional work to begin with. And that, so once you know that the information is coming from a place that is not biased or tainted by some agenda, you can really do a lot with that information. Sometimes we innovate solutions um, by, by compiling what we learn and ultimately we publish reports and what those reports do is they they match solutions to really difficult public policy problems that exist in our community. Um, our goal is the improvement of government. We work so that local resources, public resources are used by government more effectively. We are guided by um, efficiency in spending, transparency in government conduct and behavior, accountability by elected officials, meaning um, they need to do what they've promised to do and abide by the standards that citizens expect, and, uh, and effectiveness, meaning that the outcomes the government produces are effective for the citizens that it serves. BGR launched the Excellence in Government Awards in 1994 to honor kindred changemakers in local government. The awards recognize public employees and private citizens who have set goals and achieved results through exemplary dedication and performance. I serve as a board member for the Bureau of Governmental Research, but I'm also uh, honored to say that I chair the Excellence in Government Committee. Well, I really do believe that BGR has created this award. I think it was first launched in 1994, where they felt a moral obligation to give voice to and to give credit to individuals working in state and local government to ensure that those who showed up and gave 110% at their respective jobs were being recognized for fulfilling the commitment to exemplify extraordinary public service. And by that I mean those individuals that you so seldom hear about or talk about because they're in the background, yet they work tirelessly day in and day out. The Excellence in Government Merit Award recognizes 
individuals who have shown dedication, consistent performance over a period of time, over two years, um, to have stayed the course. And on the days when uh, it might have been easier to say this isn't worth it, where citizen complaints were far outweighing any demonstration of gratitude, they um, insisted on staying focused and on achieving results and, and, and effective outcomes. Well, I was very blessed to serve the state of Louisiana for nine years as state superintendent. And in that time, uh, we tried to, to create a plan, a plan that we called Louisiana Believes, that, that really assured that irrespective of a student's background, the community they come from, how much money mom and dad have in the pocketbook, that there was a basic level of assurance, a, a right, a civil right, to a quality education. First was the idea that curriculum matters, what our children know, what they study, what they come to school and read every day, what they learn in mathematics and science, that these things matter and that it's not good enough just to have a, a kind of scattershot approach to high quality curriculum. It has to be that we assure as a state that the activities, that the texts, that the challenges and the problems and the tasks that are put in front of our children every day are of the highest order. It's not just enough to say you have good tests and you've trained your teachers. The stuff that kids learn matter. I like to say that some of the problems we, we think we have today among adults, a lack of understanding of our institutions and our civic society, really start with children and the fact that maybe we never even thought to, to teach them these things in the beginning. And so today our state is one of only a very few where you can walk into virtually any classroom in our state and say, I know that that curriculum has been verified by the national experts, by the professionals, and I can be assured when I send my child to school that what they're being taught is of the highest order and not some random sales job that was done to a school board and a contract that was given to a friend. Second, we knew that when we started, while it was great to accelerate the pace at which young people were getting four-year university degrees, and of course, anytime a child goes to Southern or goes to LSU or goes to Grambling or goes to Tulane, we should be celebrating that. But we also know that in our state, only one in five adults have a four-year degree. So we could double that rate and make it 40%, and it would still only be the case that fewer than half of our adults would have a four-year university degree. All the while, we know in our state, in fields ranging from technology and business to agriculture and energy, that many, many good jobs, oftentimes jobs that are going unfilled, require an education after high school, but they don't require that every child go to Xavier or go to Dillard. Consequently, we set about to create a program called Jumpstart, a program that would make a high quality career and technical education available to every student in the state. Students who wanted to go to our universities or students who wanted to go to direct to work or students who wanted to go to community colleges. Over my tenure in office, we quintupled the number of industry credentials, especially in fields like construction, the craft trades, fields like technology, so that students had available to them not just high quality college courses like advanced placement or dual enrollment in university courses, but also could graduate high school knowing that they had a credential in hand, a credential that could never be taken away from them, that made sure they were viable in the workplace. This is not to say that students should just graduate high school and then go directly to work. Those days are over. You can't do that unless you want to go right into dead-end jobs. But it is to say that not every form of post-secondary education means Saturday night in Death Valley. It doesn't all mean purple and gold. It's just as honorable and just as dignified to pursue an upwardly mobile career through an education after high school that is not on a four-year university campus. It was the case when I came into office that we were leaving hundreds of millions of dollars on the table every year because students simply wouldn't complete their financial aid forms. And most often, tragically, those were the students that hadn't earned tops meaning the students that hadn't earned state aid were the ones that weren't applying for federal aid. Consequently, they were generating no money, money that's there for them, paid for by the taxpayers, by you and me, for them to go to college or for them to get some further education. Now you may be saying, well, those are the students that shouldn't go to college. Quite the opposite. Higher education aid, federal aid, and state aid both pay for training in welding, training in air conditioning repair, training in computer programming, training in accounting, training in legions of programs that don't require a four-year credential, but do require post-secondary education. Post-secondary education that's free for low-income Louisianans who should have been applying for it. I'm proud to say for the last three years, Louisiana has topped the nation 
in the percentage of Louisianans who have applied for, for, for financial aid. Nine in 10 public school students now, when they graduate, apply for financial aid, doubling the rate at which uh, Louisiana was performing when I came into office. And that most importantly, that reform has been scaled across the country. So the Texas and Illinois have taken it a step further. Their legislatures have passed laws and 10 more states, including the state of California, are in the process of passing laws that replicate the rule that our State Board of Education passed six years ago to make this all possible. Everything I'm describing is not the product of one superintendent. It really is the product of a team of people. It's also the teachers and the principals and the superintendents. It's also the philanthropists and the advocates, the community-based organizations, and most importantly, the parents and the students who stood up and said that change is needed and said that they wanted to be a part of it. Very often, reform and change is cast as the kind of heroic crusader that's trying to fight the fight against the establishment. I didn't experience that. I experienced that most Louisianans were on our side. They were on the side of change. They were calling for change. And when a vision for change came along, they stood up and they said, if you'll include me, I want to be a part of it. There were times when politicians would put their own political interest in front of the interests of Louisiana's children and progress in our state. They would make statements that were plainly averse to reason and averse to compassion and averse to the future and planning for the future of our great state. I hope that our state will continue to elect leaders who don't do that, who put children first. And as we look ahead to future electoral cycles, as we look forward to the remaining term of, of this current state government, I hope that we will urge them to always do what is right for our kids and never stop until we can truly assure that Louisiana has believed and in believing that all of its children have been assured a solid foundation and a great start in life. I want to thank BGR for providing me with this award. You honor our children, you honor our schools, you honor our teachers, uh, and you honor the Department of Education and the State Board of Education uh, with this award. In particular, I want to thank for this award my team, my team who worked with me for more than a decade unfailingly, the most talented and committed group of public servants anyone has ever worked with and could ever hope to work with. I also, of course, thank uh, my family, my wife Catherine and my daughter Grace and my son John Charles, recently born by the way, um, for their support of me during this time and uh, really for the families of all public servants. It's not an easy thing to, to sit by while your spouse gives their time or your, your, your father or mother gives their time to public service and to so many other children and for their unwavering support, I thank them as well. It was apparent to the mayor and frankly to all New Orleanians that we needed to put more money into our infrastructure, that big changes were needed, but those resources have to come from somewhere. There had been during the campaign policy proposals in relation to trying to get um, some of the revenue that was coming from hospitality uh, to pay for um, some of these infrastructure pieces. The genesis of this work was really looking at the vast infrastructure needs of the city, whether it's um, flooding events, standing boil water advisories, potholes, and realizing the ways that the city didn't have the resources to address those needs. We were expected to generate about $200 million in sales tax revenue, yet about nine cents on the dollar was going to go to the city for essential services. And so it's really looking at how do we take that 10% or less than 10% and grow it to really meet the needs of our city? A big part of this conversation was educating the public and engaging with our stakeholders about where these dollars are derived, where do they go, and what are processes that we can put in place so that people have a better idea of how all of this works. It is an easy argument to make to the hospitality industry that it doesn't matter how nice the marketing is for your hotel if when people get here they can't use the streets to get to your hotel or if the toilets don't work when they get here you're not going to be able to make any money and, and this is really tied to the overall conversation the broader piece that for hospitality to be successful in New Orleans, the city itself needs to be successful. It needs to be able to meet the needs of its citizens so that we can do what we need to do in relation to the largest industry in the city. I'll be honest with you, I wasn't sure that it could be done. When we started putting together these proposals and looking at the potential roadblocks, 
I wasn't certain that we were gonna achieve our goals. Everyone was saying, no, this can't be done. No, this isn't achievable. No, this is a non-starter and it's been tried before. And so really trying to garner and harness all of our resources, our intellect and all of that and take it to Baton Rouge and turn it into a yes. I mean, that was those were the obstacles. First and foremost, the mayor is the, the, the key person. This would not have happened without her leadership and her courage and her willingness to put her own political capital on the line for the benefit of the citizens of the city. We were about to go into a Ways and Means Committee hearing and the mayor showed up at the state capitol unannounced. And we had been really nervous about this committee hearing. We didn't know if it was gonna make it out of committee. And I said, look, mayor, we don't know if it's gonna make it out. Let your team take the hit for you. Let your staff take this loss for you. And she was like, I am here to fight for the city of New Orleans. She put a lot of time into winning the hearts and minds of legislators. Anytime there's a win, there are a lot of folks to be able to share that win with. The delegation was crucial, the Orleans Parish delegation in trying to get this passed. So Neil Abramson was our key go-to in relation to the passage of legislation. The city came to him with something that was outside of the comfort zone to say the least. And he came with intellect, tenacity, and was able to lead the fair share deal through the process in a way as a floor manager that we couldn't even, we couldn't even dream of. What resulted was a package of bills that really represented the true compromise of fair share in terms of not only one-time revenues, but also annual recurring revenues. In order for the fair share initiative to be successful, it took a focused and dedicated team from a mix of specialties to negotiate a compromise with tourism leaders and legislators. Liana Elliott is my deputy chief of staff. She was really crucial in the overall project management and what our steps were gonna be as far as how we got there. Tara is director of council relations. There was a lot of work that needed to be done at the local level. She directed much of that work so that we could do what we needed to do at the local level in relation to getting that revenue. Josh is our policy director. I call him my nerd. Josh was really crucial in some of the analysis of what our different options were. So he was a big part of helping us figure out um, how we could get to the, the numbers that we needed. Bo's our director of communications. So Bo did a lot of work on making sure that our messaging was strong, um, that we were doing a good job of being able to communicate what our issues and our needs were, and also educating people about what the process is and how we could get to a point that was better for the city. Ray is our Director of Neighborhood Engagement. He was organizing what were called Coffee Yard in Your Corners to talk to uh, residents, so Ray was crucial in making sure that people understood what the issues were. Sunny LaBeouf is the city's attorney. Not just her, but her entire team was really crucial in helping us figure out what our options were and what the legal protections were that needed to be in place in order to make the changes we wanted to make. Jonathan Harris was our point person uh, in the city attorney's office in relation to some of that work. A lot of the basic legal research so that we knew what our options were, John was a crucial part of, of helping to develop. Art Walton is another crucial part of the team. He's the director of all of our IGR um, office. So both on the federal, state, and local side, he was a big part of our strategy, implementation, and also our interaction with the legislature. Josh Cox is our Director of Strategic Initiatives. Josh helped to talk to our citizens and, and many of our neighborhood organizations about what we were trying to do with Fair Share. He's also been a big part of the work that we were needing to do to change some of the local institutions. Um, the New Orleans Tourism and Marketing Corporation has transitioned to the New Orleans Cultural Fund. Um, part of the revenue that goes into that culture fund was part of the conversation about fair share. Well, a lot of that local work and engagement, not just with the city council, but also with the boards and commissions that are in existence right now, had to happen also with the downtown development district, which again is a portion of the revenue that goes to fair share. Fair share is making sure that the citizens of the city benefit from the success of the hospitality industry. And if we can connect the success of our industries to the success of our people in the way that they live their lives, in the way that they are affected in their neighborhoods, then everybody's going to be invested in the success of the city overall. 
we really wanted to get involved with looking at did we have the right youth on probation? Did we have the right youth in detention? We wanted to assure that only the youth that were in detention were the ones that needed to be there. They were either a public safety risk or a risk of not showing up for court. So there was a need to develop a program and that's when we start talking about alternatives to detention or ATDs and that's what this program is that we created, an alternative to detention. And those alternatives allow us to manage our detention population and only keep those youth that need to be in detention in detention. We're using three main methods within the program and what's, what's key to this process is that the judges can order what's called the ATD continuum and that's what makes this program very unique is that we can go up and down this continuum of programs without having to go back to the court unless the court orders a specific program only. We have a probation officer who is assigned to go out and do weekly visits with a youth that is in that particular program. That is one of our lower level programs. It's a, it's a once a week meeting. We find out, make sure that the child's doing what they're supposed to do, staying out of trouble, and if there's anything that we can do to help the parent while they're waiting to go to court. The middle tier program is a little more involved. It, it requires us to have an outside contractor, which we have, and they meet with the juvenile once a day, and then they do a follow-up visit by telephone with the child to make sure they're adhering to uh, being at home and any type of rules they may have that surrounds what time they need to be home. Then the most intrusive part of the ATD program is the GPS monitor because that monitor is actually strapped on the child's ankle and monitors that child 24-7 so we can actually go on a computer and track a child's whereabouts. So it's, it's really important that we have those three different levels that we can move up and down. Our average success rate is 80 percent and that is incredible. I think the reason for that is we don't keep a child on any one program too long. There is a shelf life to any program. If a child knows they're going to be on a monitor for a certain amount of time or they're going to be uh, tracked by uh, someone, then they know how that program works. When I first came on board with this agency 19 years ago, our recidivism rates were probably 50 to 60 percent after a year. Now we track juveniles for two years after they successfully complete probation and our recidivism rates are half that. We have a children and youth planning board here in Jefferson Parish that is second to none in the state of Louisiana. At those meetings, our stakeholders all come together, whether it's a district attorney's office, the court, my agency, the coroner's office, the school system, we all come together every other month and we sit down at a meeting and we talk about our challenges and then we develop ways to overcome those challenges. And that, that is probably one of our keys to our success here in Jefferson Parish. The ATD program is definitely a money saver for the parish. If we go back and look at the last 10 years, there was a point where we were having 2,000 admits a year. Last year, we had fewer than 900 admits. Well, a lot of the funding to operate this agency, actually most of it all comes from the collection of 3.5 mills here in Jefferson Parish. So everyone who owns a piece of property in Jefferson Parish contributes to our operations. And that is, that is key to our agency's success, the fact that we have 10-year millages here in Jefferson. Joan Ruiz is our probation manager. She's, she's awesome. She oversees every aspect of probation. So all of the people who have worked in the ATD program technically fall under her umbrella. Matt Villio is our reform coordinator. He is responsible for the data. He crunches those numbers. He helps us look at outcomes. He helps keep us focused so that we can get to where we're trying to go. Colleen's one of our probation supervisors and she was one of the first ones to, to really get involved in the alternative to detention program and help set it up and, and get us focused with where we were going to go with this program. LaShonda Thomas is a, a probation supervisor. She's currently over the ATD program. This is a, a new position for her and uh, she's doing really well with it. 
Erin Ronquil is one of our probation officers and she's been assigned to the ATD program and currently she's assigned to drug court when there's a child that needs to be on a monitor is involved with, uh, with the ATD program as well. Trista Duplessis is one of our probation officers assigned to the ATD program. She works very closely with uh, Louis Bustamani. They are the ones that are out there in the trenches fighting every day. My name is Luis Bustamante and I'm a probation officer with the Alternative to Detention Program. I've been with the Alternative to Detention Program for uh, four and a half years now. Some of the positive things that I've seen the program uh, do is alleviate the numbers in detention with our detention facility and also it gives the youth an opportunity uh, to not experience the detention side of probation. Uh, it allows them to return home. Uh, continue to participate in pro-social activities, uh, continue in therapy if needed or if they're already involved in other mentoring programs. It doesn't disrupt their uh, programs that they're involved with. And we've seen many success stories. Uh, I've seen kids who graduate, kids who obtain jobs. One mistake doesn't define who they are or where they're gonna head. Jefferson Parish has continued to see positive outcomes as a direct result of the ATD program. This would not be possible without the combined efforts and support of the juvenile court judges, other justice officials, along with parish leadership. I can look at Judge Conrad and the work that she's done, and uh, she's retired now. Judge Jansen, who also recently retired, and they've worked very hard. Our, our longest sitting judge right now, uh, Judge Keller, and the great job she's done, as well as Judge Burmaster and Judge Cal Caligaro, who are now on the bench. But uh, it's important to have the judge's support and the court's support in what you do. They have to have confidence in the programming that we're developing, and over the years they did have that confidence and they worked very hard with us to get to where we are, so I'm very thankful for that. Also, my parish president. I've worked under seven parish presidents, and they've allowed me to do what I need to do without any interference and make this department the great department that it is. The Excellence in Government Award is presented every two years. BGR accepts nominations throughout the greater New Orleans region, including Jefferson, Orleans, Plaquemines, St. Bernard, St. Charles, and St. Tammany parishes. There were over two dozen nominations this year from a diverse field of citizens, governmental employees, and officials. Take the Innovation Award, how they were thinking progressively and outside the box. We're one of five charter schools in Jefferson Parish. We are the largest. We educate 2,409 students. Yes, on three campuses, it's a lot. <laughs> so we started in 2013 with Kenner Discovery Health Sciences Academy. Our facility was on Main Avenue in the Metairie, right on the Metairie Kenner line, actually. And we grew in size very quickly. We had 100 kids on our wait list the first year, and since that first year, we've had over 500 kids on our wait list. We now have over 1,800 kids on our wait list between the two schools. So we are what's known as a high-demand, high-performing school. And as you outgrow facility, one of the biggest threats to a charter school is not having their own facility. And I identified that as a challenge from early on and started talking to everyone in the business world, my own board members, friends of mine who are business people, and said, we need our own facility. I need to figure out how we can do this. That's when I learned about the Louisiana Bond Commission. When we wanted to build a facility, we then had to actually figure out how to finance this facility. And of course, the most economical way to finance it is through going through the Louisiana Bond Commission. So with my own board, we went to the Louisiana Bond Commission and asked to be on their agenda and filled out the mounds of paperwork that we had to fill out. We were a high performing school with a great retention of students and faculty. And the first month they said, we need more information. And they had some very specific questions about our performance, about the amount of growth that we had about what kind of facility we wanted to build and what did our long-term growth look like. We answered all of those questions, 
spent about another week in Baton Rouge and went back the following month and we received approval from the Louisiana Bond Commission. It was very exciting and it has paved the way for other charters to now be approved through Louisiana Bonds. We think it's important to have stakeholders in the community who both invest and believe in our school. We did get enough money from the Bond Commission to build this amazing facility. This is um, phase one of three phases. So we built the high school and this beautiful library that we're sitting in now with um, our teaching kitchen and our auctioner hospital simulation lab and nine other science labs. We built that for the high school. The next wing that goes on will be a middle school wing and the third and final wing will be a lower school wing. Through Henry Shane's vision, who is one of our founding board members, he wanted to home grow healthcare professionals. He knew that the future of careers was huge for healthcare professionals as well as technology and the two go hand in hand. So thus we built this facility for that. And Auctioner agreed to partner with us from early on. So they would provide us with software in classrooms where our kids could actually interact with doctors and nurses and talk to them through this giant screen that I was lucky enough to walk in on one day and see what they were doing. Um, they would um, bring practicing practitioners to the school and they would invite us over to do labs in one of their research labs, which was beyond exciting for our kids. We had a white coat ceremony for our seniors that just graduated. It was amazing. And my favorite auctioner email of all is, Dr. Glazer, can we land the auctioner helicopter on your campus today? And my always response is, I don't know, can you land the auctioner helicopter on my field? <laughs> And so they would, and they've done it many times. And of course, it's their emergency high care helicopter that they're landing. So our kids get to go sit in it and get to experience what that is like to give really high quality emergency medical care and then air back someone to the hospital. My background is as a speech language pathologist and I spent 18 years between private practice and being an advocate for kids with special needs. So when I first talked to the board about possibly doing this job, I said, you know, we need to be open admissions. We need to accept the child with all of the gifts and talents and kids that maybe have some lumps and bumps and, and work through that. And so that's what we did. So we have kids that are being trained that may end up being dietitians because they're big into healthy eating, but they may be working in our teaching kitchen, learning how to how to cook, how to bus tables, how to set tables. We're a tourism industry here in New Orleans. You know, a restaurant, a huge restaurant presence in New Orleans. So we're training kids for all ends of that, whether they're going to be medical doctors, nurses, dietitians, or work in the food industry. We're training them for those things. My passion really now is opening schools and providing really positive places for kids to live and learn. We're hoping to make lifelong learners out of these kids. Our administration team is very close and we value the input from our teachers. And that's really what it's about. The Citizenship Award is one that very significantly aligns with our work because our goal is to inspire citizen engagement. And so it's very important to recognize that there are citizens among us who have chosen to devote significant, substantial amounts of time for the purpose of improving government. So they stand outside of government, but they are working from the outside to cause change within. We are a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that is a source of data, research, and information for policymakers, stakeholders, the press, the public at large around issues related to early care and education in Louisiana for children ages birth through four. I started in juvenile justice, but eventually found my way to early childhood because at that time, um, the science was becoming clearer and clearer the critical importance of children uh, brain development in birth to, in children ages birth to three. And so I found myself being um, drawn to that time of life 
knowing that the impacts, if you can make an impact then, how huge it is on the life trajectory of a person. In terms of founding the Policy Institute itself, I would say I came to appreciate the lack of good information available to policymakers. And you wouldn't think that would be the case, but the fact is that most policymakers don't have access to good data, research, and even policy proposals um, based on the data and research. Um, and that's why organizations like BGR itself, for example, are so critical because even if a policymaker wants to make a good decision, often they don't have access to good information. I realized it wasn't enough at the state level just to put out good policy proposals and good data and research. After you put out that data and research, you have got to push hard and persistently to make a policy change. So I wanted to form an organization that took no public funding. That was critical and that was unique in this realm of children's issues at that time. So as I started down this space, I started working with child care providers, talking to them, finding out what their world was like. And many of them, most of them at that time, 15 years ago, basically were lucky if they could offer any kind of quality because they have no public funding. They can only get the money that their parents can afford to pay, especially those serving low-income families. Our child care providers were so much fun to work with, such amazing women. I, I, I just get goosebumps. They've been my inspiration from the beginning. Many, I could say many, many names, especially in the New Orleans area, who are often second and third generation business owners, minority owned, strong women who are my inspiration, as I say, um, who said, yeah, I want to have higher quality. What does that look like? What do we do? I mean, we didn't even know, what are the standards we should be following? We had none of that when we started. The happy news is I think the quality of care, early care and education, birth through age four in Louisiana has been transformed in the last 10 years um, from all the things we've discussed. I mean, thanks in large part to our policymakers, certainly to the governors, Governor Jindal and his passing Act 3 in his first term, to John White um, and Governor Edwards in supporting all this transformational change in what the standards are. What I tell anyone who asks me about advocacy is first, the first thing to remember is that silence means everything's okay. Policymakers truly assume that if they aren't hearing that something is wrong, then it's okay, um, literally. And so as a citizen, as a constituent, it's our job to inform our policymakers if something needs to be changed. They depend on us to do that. Number two is that it's important to understand who is responsible for the decision that you need made. Who can actually make that decision and change that policy that you're concerned about? Often I feel so bad, I see people who are doing advocacy at the local level where that decision actually has to get made at the state level. The third thing I recommend is that often our policymakers are elected, and if they're elected, they're to some degree answerable to the people who have funded their campaigns. The challenge is that often we are representing interests that can't give to campaigns. In my case, it's children. Um, and so it's a challenge because those folks who do give to their campaigns often have access to them. The cool thing is that if we get involved, giving voice to the voiceless, so to speak, then we often will give them cover. Like, they're hearing this is important. As we rebuild, as we have to reprioritize our funding, I just pray and hope and keep my fingers and toes crossed that we will prioritize this time of life, that we know we get the biggest bang for our buck. We get the highest return on investment. We can, in fact, help two generations of people, both the child and the parents, in terms of funding this time of life that we now know is so critical. The Lifetime Achievement Award is for those individuals who, over a period of 15 years or more, have remained dedicated to their public service and have, um, in an exemplary fashion, uh,
delivered results, inspired those around them, set and achieved goals many times, you know, year over year. And so the Lifetime Achievement Award is really an opportunity to say in a very significant way, thank you for your lifetime of public service from which we, the citizens of the region, have benefited. I loved political science as a major and worked for the Institute of Politics and ran a couple of political campaigns and then got involved, got hired by Sidney Bartholomew um, to work in his administration. And so that was the beginning of my career in city government. It's been my privilege to serve the city of New Orleans for 15 years. My first development project was Harris Casino, which if you recall, was not without its controversy. The project has generated $675 million to the city of New Orleans over the years, and they employ some 2,100 people. They are about to embark on a $325 million addition to the project, which will result in a 300-room hotel being built. So that will add more jobs and provide more income for the city. Post-Katrina, um, I was assigned the Canal Street Development Corporation. I was also assigned Piazza d'Italia, which is the piazza proper, um, built by Charles Moore for the World's Fair, designed by Charles Moore for the World's Fair. And there are two subsequent parcels next to it that we intend to put out for development in the future. Katrina was clearly devastating to the city of New Orleans as a government, as a people, and the board of directors at the time for the Canal Street Development Corporation were very keen on doing something. I think everybody wanted to do their part to bring something back. So at a board of directors meeting, there was a, a, lo a long discussion about what we could do to help the city return to its splendor. And it was decided that we would approach the developers and the owners of the Sanger Theater to see what it would take to come back. And so as a result of that, they decided to come back to New Orleans and we forged a public-private partnership. And what you see is a result of a $52 million restoration, total historic restoration, and which took eight years to complete. So the projects only succeed because of the teams that are put together. It's always a collaborative effort. It begins with the board of directors having a vision or the mayor having a vision and the city council and the mayor and the board agreeing on the vision. And then the, a team put together by, a, I have a great staff. We have great outside counsel with Stone Pigman who help us um, on, a, on a, all our projects. And our developers have been terrific. And so together, plans are put together to get the proper architects. In this project, for instance, there's a company called Evergreen that does historic restoration of, of interiors in theaters, and they were the first people in and the last people out. They were still painting when we were about to open the doors for the first event that came here. You know, several years ago, in anticipation of our 300th anniversary, the decision was made to try to, to create a, a master plan for the riverfront, and it meant engaging Crescent Park through to Spanish Plaza. All of those are publicly owned properties by different public entities, but they're all publicly owned properties. So with the Crescent Park being largely completed, the moonwalk underwent a $3.6 million restoration. Audubon is planning some beautiful restorations on their property. The RTA, the Regional Transit Authority, is about to embark on the rehabilitation of that site to modernize the, the ferry terminal site and have amenities for those riders that are appropriate for that site. Spanish Plaza has undergone an $8 million transformation with new tiling and an expanded fountain that, will be be that won't wet you when it's on. That's beautiful. And then finally, the linchpin for it all was the Four Seasons project. And we are thankful that the Four Seasons folks became our partners. It's gonna be a beautiful property, our first five-star hotel. And I think it will elevate all the other hotels in the city. There are a lot of good stories that are typical New Orleans stories, right? The carpet that you see through the, throughout the theater, a sample of it was given to us by a friend of Charlotte Wittenberg, who was Louis Sanger's niece. He happened to have a lot of memorabilia of the theater, which helped us make it, the, the theater and the theater experience much more authentic. We found some of the chandeliers for the theater on Royal Street and were able to purchase at a significant discount nine of 11 fixtures and get the other two fixtures reproduced. So once 
the public knew we were working on this project, we start getting phone calls about the project and either I have a story or I have some tickets from the original theater that I'd like to share. And we do have a lot of memorabilia that at some point in the near future we'd like to make available to the public for those who want to own a piece of history, a history that's so important to the city. I have a tremendous family and who understand where the passion comes from to do what we get done. And my husband, Tom Frisco, is amazing support. I'd like to thank the Bureau of Governmental Research for the honor. Um, we appreciate the work that they do on behalf of the citizens of New Orleans with the reports that they do. And I've used many of them myself to gain a greater insight into the complexities of some of the things that government likes to do. So we are, government folks are thoughtful about that. Secondly, this award needs to be shared with my colleagues at the New Orleans Building Corporation. All the folks who assist us, my colleagues with the City of New Orleans, all the Board of Directors first and foremost, the Mayor, the City Council, and other elected officials, state and locally and federally, who assist us in achieving our goals and getting these projects done. So we look forward to what the future brings. The City of New Orleans has a great future. For anyone who has the privilege of traveling, I've never been anywhere where if someone knows where I'm from, they've either been here and loved it or it's on their list of places to go. And it, it's a beautiful city with a beautiful spirit and we want to see it prosper. Most folks call me Coach Ernest, you know, and that's because I've been coaching for as long as I've been working with the city over 35 years, so uh, it's just a, a, a tag that's been stuck on me for a while, but it, it's it's good, I love it, I love it. I grew up not far from here um, in the seventh ward in Pilot Land, that they call the um, St. Bernard area. Um, we started in St. Bernard Housing Development, uh, and my father, who's a longshoreman, uh, was able to move out, you know, typical, you, you go to housing development to help you, you know, get your monies together so you can buy a house, which he did. Well, when I went to 35, it was on Kellerett Street. You know, it's, it was it was a blast. It was a blast. They prepared you to go to college, which I did. I wanted to go to the Marines, but my mom would say, hell no. So. Uh, you know, you gotta follow what mom say. So I, I wound up going to um, USL, which is ULL right now, and um, finished college there, met my wife there. People always ask, well, how many administrations you worked under? So I gotta go to my fingers and count. But uh, I, I believe that last count it was five. And they would say, well, how did you make five administrations? I just do the work, you know. It's, did what it took. You know, I did the work and people appreciated what, I, what I've done. So I was a project manager for the infrastructure work that was done out in the regional business park. I was responsible for doing all of the street work, the drainage work, the sewer work. Um, I had to pay the bills, make sure the work get done properly. And from there, I went on and started handling incentive programs and wow, it was just a whirlwind from there. One of the biggest challenges were working with other city employees. You know, so I had to learn how to work with other city employees. A lot of people go in and try to just think they have status and you can walk over these employees. You know, I, I had to learn how to work with and become friends with those employees in which I did. Uh, over a hundred employees, I probably say, I became real good friends with and was able to get a lot of work done. And, you know, you can probably find no employer that would say they never got along with Ernest Gathers. I've had over, I think, 20 bosses. Dow Cezanne, you know, he, he, he was somewhat of an inspiration. He and I worked on the McFrugals project, you know, on the Jordan Road project. 
but uh, we also brought, helped bring back the ID, IDB, the Industrial Development Board. But it was his words that kind of stuck with me, you know, and, and at first I never knew what it was he was saying, but he told me I'm a victim of my own success. And, you know, it just never dawned on me what he was talking about. Then as I grew and continued to work through city government, then I figured it out, you know, because I worked so hard, more and more people start to depend on me. So that's why I'm a victim of my own success. And I figured it out. Well, my wife didn't want me in the house so uh, <laughs> so she <laughs> sent me out to go um, help on the playgrounds and uh, with some of the schools. And I don't know, I, I just, I couldn't break away. And uh, before I realized it, I just got stuck coaching, taking kids out of town, helping them get into school. The main objective was to get them through middle school, through high school, where they can get a college scholarship. To this day, I don't know how many kids I've coached. You know, it just makes me feel good when I hear them say, you know, if not for you, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And that's, that's a good feeling. It's a real good feeling. My, my thoughts with the kids were just to give them the principles, you know, then show them what they can be as they grow up. You know, most of the times, depending on which sport, if it's basketball, I, I would go to practice from work with my shirt and tie and they see I'm a businessman, you know, and you know, one thing I always tell them, God is first. God's always first, you know, so we always, we, we end our practice with a prayer and we always take that prayer seriously. You know, but teaching them the principles of life, teaching them how to get along with each other and how to respect the parents and adults. They live a long life. And I learned that, I learned that essentially from my grandparents, but mostly from my father. You know, he's, he's a hero. That's all I can say. I know the work I did was appreciated because people would call and tell me thank you. And most of the time, that's all I needed, you know, just a thank you. And sometimes it didn't bother to me if you thank me or not, you know, but just knowing that I was able to get the job done is thankful enough for me. What bothered me was not getting it done. This mostly those projects in New Orleans East and Lower Ninth Ward that I feel that, you know, Unfairly, those, those residents out there has been somewhat neglected. And, and I don't like that. I don't like it at all. But, you know, if, if I can still try to get something done out there, I'm, I'm going to do, do my best. Do you like helping people? That's my problem. <laughs> I, I love helping people. You know, and, and I, I just can't stop. I can't stop doing it. With the conclusion of this year's program, BGR resets the clock on its next round of awards. In two years, we will gather again to learn of unexpected heroism, where individuals deliver excellence solely because it is the good and right thing to do. Between now and then, let these stories of excellence in government inspire you to value civic engagement and public service for their direct and positive impacts on our lives. Become involved in our vital public policy dialogue and find ways where you too can elevate government's potential. And as you go about this work, let this program assure you of the transformative results that occur when people commit to making a difference in local government. <laughs>